first reading this morning is taken from 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. <clears throat> if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in us who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from God is this. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. My beloved in Christ, hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ as we have it from the hand of St. Matthew, there in the 24th chapter of his account. As Jesus came out of the temple in Jerusalem and was going away, his disciples came to point out to him all the great buildings of the temple. And then he asked them, You see all these, do you not? Truly, I tell you, not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. And when Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when this will be and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age. And Jesus answered them, beware that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Messiah. And they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, See that you are not alarmed, for all this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places, and all this is but the beginning of the birth pangs. And then they will hand you over to be tortured, and will put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name and many will fall away, and they will betray one another. They will hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because 
of the increase in lawlessness, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Please pray with me. With you alone, O God, are wisdom, truth, and light. You are wisdom in a world full of folly, truth in a world content to play fast and loose, and light in the darkness we sense around us. Silence all words within me, O God, save those that show forth your truth. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer, let the people say, Perhaps you have had the experience of adding a new word to your vocabulary and then finding yourself bumping into that word all over the place, in magazines and newspapers, online. And so it was that when I decided a couple of weeks ago to preach this morning on that category of relationship that the Bible calls neighbor, I suddenly found myself bumping into the word neighbor all over the place. For example, I saw a bumper sticker that said, put your neighbor out of work, buy from Amazon. There's some truth there. And I got a bill from my insurance company, the one that is like a good neighbor. My son called me up on a Saturday morning and said, Dad, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. And I read the obituary of a man who loved taking people to obscure ethnic restaurants who said of himself, by doing so, I'm trying to get people to be less afraid of their neighbors. And then we had a bit of a dust up in our neighborhood when someone who was irritated by barking dogs started leaving anonymous letters and a $20 bill in some people's mailboxes with suggestions on where they might take their dog for training or exercise. And some people found this a little bit unnerving, but it led one person to write on the neighborhood Facebook page, first, thank you, neighbor, for the $20 which I gave to the Humane Society. Hopefully that money will go to help another dog like mine find a home. And second, I'm going to say hi to my immediate neighbors sometime this weekend, something I don't usually do because I'm both busy and quite introverted. But I want them to feel like they know me well enough to ask for help face to face when they need it. And so some unexpected good came out of all that. Jesus' central core teaching, his two-part commandment says, First, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And second, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. We know those words well, but I wonder if we've ever stopped for a moment to think about what a curious choice of love object is in the second part. You shall love your neighbor. Not just tolerate, not just accept, but love your neighbor. Why neighbor? Did you ever think about that? Notice that Jesus did not say, you shall love your family. Maybe he realized that in spite of our contemporary obsession with family, there are no happy families in the Bible. There's some very real ones, but there are no happy ones. I think country music singer Mary Carr got it about right about family when she said of family, these are the people we love big except for those moments when we want to drag them behind our truck. (laughs) And perhaps you've heard of the woman who went home to her family for the Christmas holidays and had a terribly exasperating visit. She later complained to a friend about how her her family knew just exactly how to push her buttons 
And her friend said, well, of course they know how to push your buttons. They installed them. <laughs> At its best, family love comes naturally, and family is often where we learn to love. The late Mr. Fred Rogers, creator of the long-running PBS television series, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, once asked his hearers in a commencement speech to think about and give thanks for the person who saw you into seeing, who read you into reading, who sang you into singing, who loved you into loving. And a lot of times, but not always, that person was family. But if Jesus doesn't say, love your family as yourself, neither does he say, love your friends as yourself. And while I agree with C.S. Lewis, as he put forth in his very fine book, The Four Loves, that friendship is an immensely important category of relationship in Christian practice, that's a sermon for another time. Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. And neighbors are different from friends in significant ways. One crucial difference is that we usually choose our friends, but our neighbors just show up in our lives by virtue of geography. Neighbors are a given of our place of residence. We move into a new home or a new apartment, and we've got neighbors. We didn't choose them, they're just there. Some may be friendly, some not. Some might evolve into friends, but most will not. Friends are chosen for deeper intimacy, while neighbors are just part of the local geography. And yet, Jesus said, it is neighbors whom we are called to love. So clearly, I'm pondering this word neighbor today, and I invite you to join me. Think about your own neighbors for a moment. My wife Pat and I have lived in our current neighborhood for six years, and we love it as it is diverse racially and religiously. It's warm, but not overbearing. I can't imagine anybody in our neighborhood calling the police because a person of color was going door to door doing political canvassing, as has lately happened elsewhere. We live on a cul-de-sac, and we've enjoyed getting to know our neighbors. And as I've been thinking about how we relate to our neighbors, I'm a bit surprised about how these relationships have just kind of evolved without much conscious intention at all. Without ever having negotiated, I mow a portion of my neighbor's lawn that happens to adjoin my yard, and he snow blows my sidewalk in the winter. We chat when we see each other and share concerns about the neighborhood. There was a shooting a few blocks away a while back. He is a very conservative person, and I am not, but I'm very glad to know him and thankful to have him as a neighbor. And on the other side is a second marriage couple. We take in each other's mail and lend a hand when something heavy needs lifting. We feed each other's dogs when we're away. They're very private people. We all get together around Christmas time each year for hors d'oeuvres, and the conversation's always pleasant, laughter abounds. But I don't think any of us wants anything more in terms of relationship. We're right in the Goldilocks zone. Not too hot, not too cold, just right. But we also have a couple of neighbors who are not like this at all. One is an elderly widow, who is content with a circle of non-neighborhood friends who visit her regularly, but she always waves when we see her. And then there is one neighbor who is downright unfriendly to the point of hostility. She doesn't speak to others. She doesn't make eye contact. She writes judgmental comments on our Facebook page. And she has called the police on us when she thinks our cars might be parked illegally. Why, I don't know. And Jesus said, love your neighbor. Isn't that just like him? (laughs) 
It's just like him because as preacher E.V. Hill once said, it's no trick to love the lovely, but it takes a child of God to love the unlovely. And I'm trying, not very successfully so far, to figure out how to love this irascible neighbor. And all this matters especially just now because in addition to our understandable propensity to hang out with people we like and people who are like us, we live in a time when many voices are seeking very hard to divide the world into us and them, into friend and foe, into neighbor and other and therefore lesser. And so perhaps more so than in a very long time, we as Christians and as a Christian community are called to double down right now on loving our neighbor and to work to ever widen the circle of those that we consider our neighbors. This is perhaps our most important witness just now. Our gospel lesson comes from the closing section of Matthew, and Jesus' disciples are getting anxious because the times they are a-changing, the end of Jesus' life is drawing near, and they seem to realize it. And Jesus does not calm their anxiety with a few memorable platitudes. No, he says, you know what, fellas? It's going to get worse before it gets worse. There will be wars and famines and earthquakes and persecution of good people and betrayals and leaders will arise saying they have all the answers to all our problems, even proclaiming their greatness in messianic terms. And you and I know there are Christians who take these words all too literally and somewhat egotistically and say, see, Jesus is talking about us and about our days, our troubled times, the end is near. That in spite of the fact that in the text itself, Jesus says, these are not signs of the end, but birth pangs. So what do you think is trying to be born just now? Might it be an increase in neighborliness, in love of neighbor? I sure hope so. Because Jesus goes on to say that because of an increase in lawlessness, the love of many will grow cold. And that is descriptive of our time. To make a bad pun, that's chilling. If our love is growing cold, that's a bad sign indeed. Because what the world needs now is love, sweet love. Warm, sweet, neighborly love, the kind born of God's love for us that we heard about in the letter from 1 John, our first reading this morning. But there's a temptation in the other direction, isn't there? There's a temptation to hunker down and draw into a little circle of our best friends and kind of look suspiciously out over everyone else. Is that what it means to be Christian now? I don't think so. Jesus says those who endure, that is, those who continue in love, will be saved. The message is clear. Don't turn inward. Turn outward to others, even in these perilous times. Pat and I were invited to a house concert recently, a gathering where someone opens their home to an indie musician and invites a bunch of folks over for a potluck. It was quite an evening, and not just because the singer-songwriter was terrific. The host couple are Jews, as were some of the guests, and there were Christians there of various stripes, some Unitarians. And as the evening went on, in came a Muslim family that we know from our work with the Zamels, our congregation's refugee family. And because few of the guests had met each other previously, we all had to muster up our courage and try to exercise our social skills and actually talk to people we don't know. 
And I came away from the evening full of wonderful food and wonderful conversation, thinking we had been in that place where people will come from north and south and east and west and sit at table in the kingdom of God. And maybe you've been there too. Week before last, we went to a showing of the movie The Sultan and the Saint our, at our exceptionally fine Kalamazoo Public Library. The movie is set in Egypt in the early 13th century when Christian crusaders from Europe were trying to conquer Muslim Egypt. And it is a story I had never heard. How St. Francis traveled from Italy to Egypt to try to stop the crusader armies from fighting. He tried to teach them that all people are brothers and sisters, neighbors, even if they lived across the sea and were of a different faith. And he failed miserably. The battles went on and on. But against all odds, St. Francis was able to cross over to the Muslim side and to get through the Muslim army's lines and to meet with and talk theology with the head of the Egyptian army, the devout Sultan Kamil. And it must have been quite a conversation because in the end, Sultan Kamil provided thousands of loaves of bread each day to feed the defeated crusader army until they could return home. And St. Francis went home and incorporated many of the 99 names for God that are found in Islam. It's a pretty expansive view of neighbor, wouldn't you say? But it shows that when we see folks as neighbors to love rather than as enemies to fear, God just might teach us something important and wonderful through them. I graduated from seminary over four decades ago now, and a lot of what I learned has drifted out of my increasingly unreliable memory into the mists of time. But I can remember as if I heard it this morning, my theology professor, the Reverend Dr. George S. Hendry saying, love in the New Testament is measured by the differences it can span. It's not measured by depth of feeling. It's not measured by dizzying emotion, even by endurance through time. It is measured, love, by the differences it can span. My beloved in Christ, what if? What if we took Jesus' commandment to heart, truly to heart, and started trying to love not just our family and friends, but to see everyone everywhere as neighbor? And to see if indeed our love can bridge or span all those differences that so many want to exploit with fear, which only love can cast out. What if? What if that's what it means to be Christian right now? We saw another fine movie recently. It is a documentary on the life and work of St. Fred Rogers, entitled, Won't You Be My Neighbor? Mr. Rogers, a Presbyterian minister, had the astonishing gift, born of his faith, of being able to see everyone and anyone as a neighbor. Like many of you, our children grew up with him, and one of the more entertaining aspects of welcoming our Brazilian son-in-law into our family was teaching him about Mr. Rogers so that he could understand the family one-liners. <laughs> the movie makes clear that who Mr. Rogers was on television is who Fred Rogers was all of the time. This was no act. It is a beautiful film, and a lot of tears flowed in the theater as we watched it. Why? Not just because his goodness is so winsome, but because he calls us to this central teaching of Jesus to love our neighbor, which we know in our heart of hearts, our soul of souls, is the only way into the kingdom for which we so long. 
And I want to share with you a few things that Fred Rogers believed, but more importantly lived. He wrote this. All we're ever asked to do in this life is to treat our neighbor, especially our neighbor who is in need, exactly as we would hope to be treated ourselves. That is our ultimate responsibility. He said, I believe that appreciation is a holy thing. That when we look for what's best in the person we happen to be with at the moment, we're doing what God does all the time. So in loving and appreciating our neighbor, we are participating in something sacred. He said, I believe that at the center of the universe there dwells a loving spirit who longs for all that's best in all of creation, a spirit who knows the great potential of each planet as well as each person, and little by little will love us into being more than we ever dreamed possible. That loving spirit would rather die than give up on any one of us. Thank you, Jesus. He said at the center of the universe is a loving heart that continues to beat and wants the best for everyone. Anything we can do to help foster the intellect and spirit and emotional growth of our neighbor, that is our job. And those of us who have this particular vision, that would be the church, must continue against all odds. Is it just me or do you think that maybe Mr. Rogers knew something about this text about loving your neighbor? Maybe he even read our lessons from John and Matthew this morning, but what matters is whether or not we are familiar with and as committed to obeying that commanded as he was. Whether or not we will try to love all people as neighbors, especially in these divisive times, think about the person you don't love. Think about the neighbor you can't stand and pray to be made able to do so. I recently came across a wonderful story from a Unitarian minister named the Reverend Patrick O'Neill. Not sure how an Irishman got to be a Unitarian, but there you are. It's about the Maasai tribe in Africa, and I want to conclude with it. The Reverend O'Neill writes, Among the most accomplished and fabled tribes of Africa, no tribe was considered to have warriors more fearsome or more intelligent than the mighty Maasai. It is perhaps surprising, then, to learn that the traditional greeting that passed between Maasai warriors is this. And how are the children? Not hello, not how you doing, what's happening, but and how are the children? It is the traditional greeting among all the Maasai, acknowledging the high value that the Maasai always place on their children's well-being. And even warriors with no children of their own would always give the traditional answer. All the children are well. Meaning, of course, that peace and safety prevail, that the priorities of protecting the young and the powerless are in place, that Maasai society has not forgetten, forgotten its reason for being, its proper functions and responsibilities. All the children are well means that life is good. It means that the daily struggles for existence do not preclude proper caring for the young. I think Mr. Rogers would have liked that. I think Jesus would have liked that. I hope we like that. Because for all the children to be well, always and everywhere, on our border with Mexico, at Edison School, in Syrian refugee camps, in Yemeni hospitals, in neonatal ICUs, in foster homes, for all the children to be well, we will all have to do better at loving our neighbors, no matter who they are, no matter where they are. And how are the children? All the children. All the children. All the children are well, and so shall they be. 
when we learn to love our neighbors. May it so be. Amen.